This is Duke University. As the media landscape has changed significantly over the last couple of years, it's become increasingly difficult for folks who are interested in local news to do the kind of work that they're interested in. Today we're joined by Frank Stacio, longtime host of The State of Things, for the NPR affiliate here in Durham, WUNC. And we're also joined by Anthony Wilson, who's a reporter and anchor for WTVD here in Durham, North Carolina, local ABC affiliate, as we talk about the challenges of doing local news. And later we're joined by bassist John Brown and vocalist Nina Freelon as they talk about their new holiday release simply titled Christmas. My name is Mark Anthony Neal and this is Left of Black. Yeah. Eric, you're a real life Eric. G for this one. <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon and welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined this afternoon by two local journalists, Anthony Wilson, who's a weekend anchor and reporter for WABC TV, Frank Stacio, who has been the longtime host of the State of Things, WUNC FM, here in the Triangle region. Um, you, you know, I wanted to have the chance for you to come in. Um, you know, both of you have kind of a long history in this work. You know, Anthony, you've been at WABC now for, for 20 years. Let me stop you for one second. It's the same family. Right. Family. WABC is a station in New York. Right. They're both owned by Disney, but here in Durham, it's WTVD. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. WABC one day, but no, not right, right now. Yeah. And Frank, of course, you know, you've been the host of the State of Things now for six years. Um, you also have a longer history working in public radio, working uh, the, the Talk of the Nation and a few other shows. I often wonder for the work that you do, um, and I get to see all your work and, and have notably been impressed by it and, and the way that, you know, you're connected in interesting kinds of ways. What has been the challenges over the last 20 years from the environment in which you started working mm -hmm. And, and the environment you're in now? You know, are there things that you can no longer talk about? Are there stories that you just can't cover? Um, you know, we're just coming past an, an election season here in the state of North Carolina. And in some ways, you know, North Carolina was an outlier, <laughs> you know, given what it looked like in 2008. Does that pose just kind of partisan politics, right? You know, does it pose a challenge for you to tell the kind of stories, to cover the kind of stories that you want? Mm -hmm. We're kind of lucky in the sense that the show itself, this show, has created a niche for itself. But for instance, when I was doing Talk of the I would fill in as a, as a fill in anchor for Talk of the Nation, I would propose the kind of big idea programs that we do to put things in context. So, for instance, we did a thing on voter suppression. Yeah. But it was voter suppression with a long history of, of civil rights in the United States. Right. So we do this whole hour that, that puts everything in context. I can't do that at NPR. Yeah. They, they, they constrict that and say, no, no, it, it takes too much time. We don't develop it. It's curious to me because we have the same audience, essentially. I mean, you just sort of scope, you know, right? You scale it up from, yeah. from Raleigh Durham. Um, so in a sense, I have more breadth and latitude here on this program than I would nationally. They'll never do that kind of a thing or give it that much time right. you know, at the national level. And the challenge for local television for us, almost every story is fair, but we've got the limitation of time. Generally speaking, our stories are two, less than two minutes, sometimes a little longer. But we also have to get people who are willing to talk. Yeah. And some of the topics that we may broach people are not going to necessarily be honest about it, and particularly when you're talking about the kind of cycle we just had with politics. People may tell Frank one thing, they may tell you one thing, tell me something altogether different, depending on who you're approaching. So the real challenge is to get people to feel comfortable enough to be honest, in some cases brutally honest. Do you feel there's a desire to dumb down to the audience? Hmm. I mean, part of that goes to what you were just saying, Frank, in terms of being able to, to think big ideas right, over an hour long time. You know, most folks will tell us that, you know, the audience isn't interested in thinking big thoughts. Right. right. You know, they just want small little stories that speak to who they are. And of course, you're in an interesting environment, you know, at WNC, Frank, in that, you know, this is, you know, listener driven. Right. right. You know, fundraising and all those kinds of things that you have to speak to. It's not so much dumbing it down as um, because attention spans have shrunk in some ways, because the news cycle has shortened the lifespan of every story and gotten it down to a nine-second soundbite, 
there's a certain pressure on us to make sure that whatever big idea we want to talk about is rooted or anchored in the headline. And the headlines are changing every eight minutes. So for us to do what, what we, we, we sometimes call the Vulcan mind melt, <laughs> where we have to somehow get that headline, because there's, there's so much behind that headline. There's so, it is so deep and so rooted in, in, in a historical context as well as a cultural context broadly in the state. If I don't tell that, I'm not telling the story. Yeah. So the challenge has always been, how do I, because I know there's an appetite for it. It's not true that people don't have the attention span. It's that sometimes managers get a little antsy when you start going off the headlines, right? You know this feeling. Uh, so how do, we, how do we make sure that we're, that we're relevant at the top and then we broaden to tell a deeper story. That has been, that's getting harder and harder to do. Mm. Yeah. You do want to bring them in. You want to necessarily grab them by the lapels, metaphorically speaking, and say, listen, this is really important. You need to pay attention to this. And again, the trick is telling it with interesting people. Sometimes the experts are you know, wonky. Mm -hmm. And when you're competing, in the case of television, with hundreds of channels, and in the case of radio, people can just reach over and punch mm -hmm. that button. Mm -hmm. You don't want the attention to drift. So the challenge for us as storytellers is to make this compelling enough that you don't want to leave. You want to sit in the car and listen to what Frank is saying. You want to not turn to HBO, mm -hmm. but that we've got a really good story on television. And you want to sit there and watch it. The other problem we've got nowadays, and Frank, you know this, we're competing with the internet. Huh? <laughs> you know, people are not giving us 100% of their attention at any time. They're sitting there with their handheld devices. They're half listening, they're half watching. Yeah. In some cases, they may be engaged in something totally different. So we're competing with that as well. So that's the challenge, to make sure that we have enough of a good story, a compelling story, to get them to look up from time to time and say, oh yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, has you, have you found that there's a lot of pressure, Anthony, on you to be present in social media. Um, I know that you're on Twitter and, and, and Facebook. Frank, I know that you're there, but less so. <laughs> well, and I just, I just got off Facebook, but that's another story. <laughs> well, they do expect everybody who's working, at least in commercial television, perhaps not so much in public, because I started off in public two years ago before there was an internet. But yes, they expect you to move across all those platforms. And it's not just promotion. We know people are going to the internet to express themselves. Yeah. We go there to find out what people are thinking, to take the pulse. Yeah. But at the same time, because we're supposed to be objective, we're not supposed to get into any flame wars with anybody, and people do have strong opinions. And that's something that you have to be careful with, especially on your personal Facebook page. I've seen people go at it, and have had to come in and sometimes referee. Yeah. <laughs> and say, okay, we, we don't need to go there right now. It's good that you have an exchange of ideas. But to answer your original question, yeah, there is a definite mandate for everybody who's in broadcast journalism to get acquainted with and be active on social media. It's a must. I, I've been watching NPR, and they're, they're making this transition now to do online shows, little six-minute spots, you know, using video, because young folks, you know, that's, that's how they want. You're not going to listen you know, to tell me more with Michelle Martin necessarily, right? You know, if you're talking about young black folks, um, what's the challenge like these days, you know, getting young folks interested in your case, you know, in, in terms of public radio? I, I, I can't answer that because I don't do the marketing. What I know is our demographics skew younger than, than the average demographics for the radio station. So how an old white guy is pulling in young students. And we also have the largest African American audience uh, yeah. in, on the station. So I'm not sure what it is we're, could, because every focus group and every expert and consultant will tell you that what we're doing on that show is a loser. It will lose you young audience. It will lose you almost everybody. So we're the bumblebee that can't fly. I'm not sure what the answer is. I do think it has to do with storytelling. I think we have, I mean, I don't want to do a plug for the show here, but I think we've got a great staff who can find the right people who can yeah. actually, you know, we have people like you on the show who talk about culture in a way that isn't wonky. And when that happens, uh, you know, I think people say, oh, well, there's something going on here. Why they're listening, why we don't have to have the, the pyrotechnics and the great social media uh, presence that everybody says we should have. 
Yeah. I mean, in some ways, Frank, I mean, your show really is an outlier in terms of the commitment to cover a diversity of folks, you know, in this area, right? You know, I, I can almost guarantee that if I want to find an African-American story, right, I can find it on the state of things, right? I might argue that I could find it more so on the state of things than I might find on Michelle Martin's show, right? You know, because, you know, Michelle's trying to pitch to a different kind of audience, right? How do you present an African-American, you know, perspective to a broad-based audience, right? You know, that's not necessarily what you're interested in, right? You're trying to reflect what the community looks like, you know, at this point in time, and, and, well, and great stories, yeah. And how, and how that community tells its own story. So, um, so one thing we try to avoid is not telling stories as though it, that, that everybody doesn't look like me as an exotic species, mm -hmm. and I'm having you on as a kind of an anthropological experience. Mm -hmm. What's your, how do you tell your story, and then how do I, re, how do I react to what you, and I think, not talking with an accent, in a sense, not allowing people to tell a story in their own vernacular. Uh, maybe that's what's going on there, and that's what makes it different. Anthony, you've been a longtime member of the National Association of Black Journalists, NABJ. Um, you know, what we know over and over again, particularly here in the Triangle region, that there is on air talent. Oh, yeah. You know, whether it's, you know, your station or in the NBC affiliate, even the CBS affiliate, you know, the Negroes all over the place, <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, two of them hosting together. Um, but what we also know is that whatever the on air talent looks like, that doesn't necessarily mean that folks are present to make certain kind of editorial, you know, uh -huh. decisions, right, in the newsroom, yeah. right? We know we don't see folks there. And so what's the challenge for you to navigate, you know, your position on air with a desire to push for certain kinds of stories, you know, in the newsroom. Well, as you pointed out, the decisions about what goes on the air are always made, I guess, by committee. But there are managers who make the final decision. And we pitch the stories. We come in with ideas. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the idea that you pitch is going to be your story. It could go to somebody else. But as you say, when you are one of a few, most newsrooms strive for diversity, but they're not all as diverse as they could be. Yeah. You are de facto representative of people who look like you. And as we all know, there is no such, you know, just a column of this is what all black people think, this is what right. Asian people think. But you bring your own experiences to the table. And you keep your ears open. Because if you are a smart reporter, you're listening to what's going on in the total community. And you come in, you make your pitch, and if you make your pitch well, and people are at the table who know that you can tell a good story, it's basically, I guess it's like being a politician. Yeah. You come in and say, here's what we think is good. This is going to be the one people are going to talk about. And this is why this is important. Yeah. And if you build a track record of being a compelling storyteller, you hope that will help you sell that idea and you get to put it on television. Do you find it's a challenge to deal in the newsroom with managers, for instance, that presume a certain level of expertise <laughs> about quote unquote communities of color or minority communities, right? That they really know what kind of story, right? And, and very often they're gauging that by seeing, you know, what a Today Show or Good Morning America or CBS This Morning are doing in terms of those kind of stories. And, you know, locally that's a very different audience, right? I mean, you're also balancing, you know, what is local news. You know, local news is always an interesting kind of animal, particularly around race, right? You know, how do you cover crime, right? right? How do you cover violence, right? You know, how do you find that balance between telling a story around violence and crimes that your audience needs to know without it being simply framed as the only time you ever see black bodies, you know, on local television. And there is the question of perception versus reality. If you right. see, if you're watching television, you don't watch every single day and every single show, but you happen to turn it on and see that there are black people in jumpsuits or black people in compromised <laughs> positions, you may or may not stick around to see the story about the regular black person who was talking about something that has nothing to do with crime talking about uplifting the community. But if you all you see through tunnel vision is the negative, you're going to think that's what the station is yeah. specializing in. So the challenge here is to try to tell both sides because there's pathological behavior in all communities. Yeah. And we obviously go in there and try to pitch the positive stories. But someday a story that they happens to be a story that's hard to tell. And if that's your assignment, you go out and you try to tell it straight. Yeah. You come back later and come with something that is not like that and hopefully the people who are critical of the kind of coverage that sometimes goes in broadcasting will stick around and see mm -hmm. that other side. But you're correct that the challenge is convincing not just the managers, but the people we see in the community who all look to you and say, why do you always show fill in the blank, negative right. image? Mm -hmm. And the word always is a, a real dangerous one because of course we can tell them 
till cows come home. We don't always do that. Yeah, right. If you think that's what you always see, I may not be able to convince you <laughs> that yeah. we don't always do that. All you can do is stand or fall on your record of work, your body of work, and if people will see that you've been fair and tried to be really objective, hopefully they will see that you're the kind of reporter they can see different kinds of stories right. from, as opposed to the community is in a real uh, sad state, and these are horrible people, and look, you have to watch out because you might get attacked. Perfect example. You've seen the stories that have been told about the tobacco trail, yeah. the American tobacco right. trail here yeah. in Durham. And anyone who lives in the area knows this is a very popular area for exercise. And 99% of the time, nothing happens there. Right. Every once in a while, someone is attacked. And that's you know a terrible thing for people who are attacked. But depending on who you are and what your perception is, some people say, well, you can't go to Durham because you might get jumped on the exercise trail. We know that's not true. <laughs> But we're fighting against that perception among some viewers and that perception among some people who make decisions about what's being done. You know, you gotta let them know, listen, this is a benign area most of the time. Yeah. When something happens, you have to go in there and report it straight and tell it actually yeah. happened. But that's why it's so important to know how perception works versus the numbers. That's if right. you've got, you know, equal minutes to uplift versus crime, mm -hmm. that doesn't tell the story. If people come to you and say, how come I only see black people on TV in jumpsuits? Something's happening in perception. You've got to pay attention to that. And that's, I mean, I went to our management and said, look, we name every soldier who has fallen in these wars of ours. And I think that's a fine thing to do to honor people who have died. We don't honor the names of people who have died to violence in the, right. in, in, on the streets. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and a manager literally came back and said, well, most of those are drug dealers. And I said, you understand? Based on what? You're, well, based <laughs> right. on what, A, yeah. so there's this the cultural bias, but then B, uh, what? They're all human lives, aren't they? And so right. th this was my argument. It, and, and so there's this bias built in that some lives are actually more worthy than more others. Value, right. and, it's a fight. and I've actually lost the fight. I can't, I, it's, it's over and, uh, until I come back to it. So, so these are perceptions that we, once we know that, then we have to come back in, in, in greater abundance and say, to counter this perception that is in the public mind, I've got to go work overtime yeah. and, and create this counter image so that there's at least another narrative competing with this idea. And back to what we said before about the internet, that the television and the broadcast traditional media are not the only way to get the message out. If you are active on social media, you can basically do what we're doing here. Yeah, just put right. it on the web. It may not be as mass media oriented as broadcasting is concerned, but if you are, as you say, posting interesting information, if you are doing this kind of a podcast, if you do an audio or video, and put it out there. You know, there's YouTube, there's Vimeo, there are all kinds of ways, ways to, to get, get message out there. your yeah. message out. If you have a positive story that is not covered on our regular media, the alternative is also there. Yeah. You're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined by Anthony Wilson, who is a weekend anchor and reporter for the local ABC television affiliate. Frank Stacio, longtime host of the State of Things, WUNC-FM, uh, public radio here in the Triangle region. I'm, I'm reading Eric Degen's book, uh, Ray Spader, um, and it's an interesting kind of conversation about how we now have an audience of Americans who already have in their mind what they believe in. Mm -hmm. Right, and instead of you know going to get counter narratives, they go to places where they know their feelings are going to be reinforced. I mean, that, it's the it's the Fox News mm -hmm. model. Um, how have you been able, both of you, been able to navigate? You know what is, you know whether we're talking about MSNBC, which does their work from the left, mm -hmm. um, you know, or you know Fox News, you know from the right. CNN is trying to figure out what exactly it is, you know, with it. <laughs> within that context, um, you know, do you find it difficult to be able to tell stories, you know, in which folks aren't, haven't already decided what they think about a group of people or what they think about an issue, and they really want you just to reinforce hmm. their feelings about this? It's a good question, because I think that they're going to think anyway. Yeah. I mean, you can't worry too much about people's perception, unless and until it comes to the point where you've got to look at that person in the face and have that person become honest with you. If they think that your worldview leans in one way or the other, they are going to bring that to your conversation. So our challenge is to appear objective. Obviously, everybody's got an opinion. Right. But if you feel that you can come to us and honestly express your opinion, no matter what it may be, 
And if we're going to treat your opinion with some respect, yeah. I mean, obviously there's some things that are said that can be inflammatory. You don't want to necessarily put that out there. But if you've got a story rated two sides, you want to get two sides. You don't necessarily want to say, here's what everybody on this side says, but some people don't agree with that. <laughs> I mean, if you can give me this and give me that, they're not always equivalent. Some things are going to be, this is an awful situation. Yeah. This is what we're talking about. But in any other situation, if you try to be balanced, I hate to use that cliche because it's become a balance, uh, a cliche with Fox News, but you yeah. really do try to pr provide a balance. Yeah. And if you can do that, theoretically, people will at least give you a little bit of a listen. But there are other people who have their minds made up from the very beginning, I think. What do you think, first? Well, I, absolutely. They have their minds made up, and that happens with us, too. People listen to public radio expecting for, expecting a liberal bias to be uh, validated. And mm -hmm. when we don't do that, I get a lot of hate mail. You know, why'd you have that guy from Heritage Foundation mm -hmm. on? You know what he was, I literally got emails that said, well, you know what they're going to say. So, well, they have to have the right to say right. it. Pope Foundation. Kind of, right. Pope right. Foundation. Right. 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 Uh, uh, but the other part of that is we, I, so when I was at Talk of the Nation, we always did the polarity. You had to do the left, right, and then we tried to keep it balanced. I actually don't see it that way. I almost think the polarity is the thing that reinforces a kind of the, some of the systemic problems that, that we're yeah. trying to work against. It is not about left, right. That that reinforces an idea that there's only two ways to, to think look about at something. Right. Right. And it, it might be left, and it might be it might be above and beyond. But but wherever it is, it's not just these two poles. And to think that everything has to find their way to one or the other. Especially when you're in the majority, right? Especially when you know when you've already counted the beans, and then you say there's one or the other. Let's count. Let's vote. Mm -hmm. Well, how's it going to come out? Yeah. You know, uh, your, your colleague Mike Munger does a great exercise where he can take a two-party system and he can make the vote come out the way he wants yeah. right, by setting up a, a primary system. So, um, so trying to create, trying to do storytelling that gets you out of that mode and allows your brain to work the problem mm -hmm. through in a new way is, is one trick uh, kind of around that. Otherwise, we do get hate mail from both sides. Oh, yeah. Why did you fill in the blank? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about Durham for a moment. Um, I, I've been here now for eight years. You know, Durham has a kind of perception in comparison to Chapel Hill and Raleigh. You know, it's a city that's more than 40% black. You know, when you tell folks that you live in dorm or you work in dorm, you know, folks just have these interesting responses, right? How can you live there? Mm -hmm. um, talk about the challenge of representing, you know, what is a, you know, very changing dorm, right? You know, it's this foodie town now. I'm not necessarily all that except, you know, all that excited about five dollar cupcakes, mm. you know, in restaurants that close on Monday unless, you know, like like they're fine dining in restaurants. I mean, we're talking about cupcakes, um, but all that stuff has changed. You know, you know, we all spend some time, you know, down at, at VU, for instance, um, and, and all these interesting business, you know, waffle, chicken and waffle and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff happening. Danes, you know, here in the city. What's the challenge of representing what is a vibrant city now? you know, in Durham in comparison to what is the reputation of Durham, you know, for so many folks in the region. You've seen that uh, t-shirt that says Durham is not for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's really true because if you have grown up in certain cities, I'm from Baltimore originally, mm -hmm. and Oakland, California comes to mind as well, New Orleans, these are cities with personality. Detroit. Detroit too. Right. These are cities where you've got people who are strivers, they mm -hmm. may have a blue collar vibe, but they also like to, to party, and very arts oriented, yeah. and that's what Durham is. Now what Durham has been received as in the past because of a number of different reasons is a dangerous place. Right. And as you say, it could have something to do with the minority population, at least the perception by some people. At the same time, it has a long history of strivers and achievers who happen to be black. And what's happening now is it's become a much hipper place. Yeah. And I have no problem telling anybody that I live in Durham because everybody wants to be in Durham. When right. they find out what right. it really is like. It's also a perception that the school's here from me. I've got a child in school here, and it's a great school. And once again, as long as you've got a situation where everybody's not rushing to Durham and right. crowding the streets, you know, as a Durhamite, I say, hey, y'all can come and visit. <laughs> no problem. But I don't think it's that hard to, to pump up Durham anymore. It, it has that industrial reputation. It used to be the cigarette capital. Now it's the city of medicine. That's what they market it as. Yeah. And it's a place that's a pretty 
nice place to live and grow. I mean, it's got its problems like everyone else, but it's it's not a bad town, and it's not that hard to say that you're from here. You know? Yeah, and uh, same thing. I mean, I've been here for six or seven years, and I was here while it was becoming cool. Yeah. I think I'll take full responsibility. For that. <laughs> That's right. As you can see. Uh, but it's so for me, it's always been a cool place, and I think that's it, that gets to I'm back to some of your your original question: why you need people with um, cultural sensitivity and, and actual experience in management positions. How you feel about things, what your what your sense of a place is, has everything to do with how you're going to represent it. It's not hard for me. I, but I try to imagine what it would be like to go back to Buffalo, where I'm from, <laughs> which is a city that you just have to apologize for every time, time you say right. it. You have to apologize for the weather, you have to apologize for the air, etc. <laughs> Not the wings, but... <laughs> the, the wings are good. They're famous. <laughs> anyway, actually. But, uh, so, so here's the deal. If I was back, in, and I do try to imagine, if I'm doing the show in Buffalo, what would that be like? Yeah. Would there be some hint of apology? Would there be some kind of inferiority complex mm -hmm. that I would bring to every show saying, yeah, we used to be this, but now... You know, uh, now we're a great place, and I don't have that about Durham, so it it makes me more mindful of that you than know. anything. What and you bring your your own. And it, of you know, mentioned inferiority complex, and, and that's something that I actually see in terms of how Duke navigates Durham. Uh -huh. You know, sometimes Duke show feels as though it has to apologize. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for being in dorm, for faculty having to live in dorm. Um, but once you actually get here on the ground, right, it's, it's a very different kind of experience. Right? Yeah. Well, of course, do you get that episode a few years ago with the lacrosse players, which right. made a lot of people get polarized. And it got real ugly on social media. I was going to say that. People were coming with all kinds of outrageous statements. Yeah. And it created some polarization, I think, in the town. And, you know, some mistrust, for better or worse, unfortunately, because what they were hearing didn't necessarily represent Duke is an institution, right? but depending on how much you were willing to step out of your comfort zone and learn about the institution, that might affect your perception of Duke versus Durham. But at the same time, Duke has created some real nice public spaces yeah, open to absolutely, the public absolutely. for the community, so it all depends on how much you're willing to come and explore. Right, the work that, you know, that Aaron Greenwell does with Duke right. performances as, as being one great example of that, right? The, the National Museum, you know, which has been very cognizant of, of where it is. We just went through uh, an election cycle. Six billion dollars, right, in terms of money spent. Uh, Two billion dollars on <laughs> the presidential election alone. Were you surprised by all the money spent and, and were you surprised by the outcome? Hmm. The amount of the money was, was stunning, but then you realize what's at stake. It all comes down to power. Yeah. And people are willing to spend money in order to control certain portions of what happens in this country. Uh, I think that and some of the, the tenor of some of the ads that came from outside sources. Yeah, right. You know, Crossroads, GPS. Basically, open the floodgates for the money, and also the I don't have to necessarily say that I'm affiliated with these people. Right. You know, you can have plausible deniability. So, some of what we heard and saw, and the amount of it, because there was so much of it on the air, yeah. that cost a lot of dough. That was pretty amazing. I don't think, in fact, I know we've never seen <laughs> that level of conversational caller. Yeah. You know, like it was basically one side, of, they would put the information out, and then people would react. But that was unprecedented. The results. Uh, the fact that North Carolina is now dominated by Republicans, it's been dominated by Republicans before. Not every single branch of government, not right. since I've been here. So that may be unprecedented, at least in this century as we're going so far, but it remains to be seen what's going to happen when that becomes reality after the first of the year. Yeah, the amount of money didn't surprise me at all. I mean, six billion is chump change when you think about the amount of money that, that the people who are, you know, when you're talking about privilege and what they're right. protecting, mm -hmm. that's nothing. Right. And, and there's going to be more and more. I, I am not quite ready to say that you see the money didn't you know, win, went out, see money didn't work this time. Mm -hmm. I've heard that argument, see it didn't work. Give them time. You have the most extraordinary campaigner and politician in American history, Barack Obama. Nobody knows how to spend money on a campaign better than that man. Right. 
once we start seeing different candidates, and, and I'm not sure that Mitt Romney was, was the greatest genius or even in the top ten, in terms of, and just in terms of campaigning, right. just in terms of campaigning, just a political strategy, strictly. Um, so, so in a way, politically, you had a mismatch. If they ever become matched and, and that, the torrent of money, we're going to see more than $6 billion next time. Absolutely. Time. It's going to have a lot bigger influence. Uh, were you surprised? And, you know, Obama loses North Carolina, and, and there was this interesting narrative coming from black ministers mm -hmm. that were very critical of Barack Obama in the aftermath of Amendment 1, in the aftermath of him going very public in support of, of same-sex mar marriage personally, right? You know, he wasn't going to use his bully pulpit as president to, to do anything, right? He was very clear that it's, state, it's a state issue. Um, do you think that played a lot in terms of him not really getting African Americans out the same way he might have in, in 2008? Well, that's assuming that he didn't. I think he did. Yeah. I think there was a perception that there, and I won't say perception, there is reality. Some people in the black community may have been turned off by his support of same-sex marriage. At the same time, some people were saying, well, consider the alternative. Right. Which of these candidates is actually going to be most sensitive to what I believe is important. At the same time, I had a discussion with a very politically active cousin of mine just the other day. A lot of black people are saying, well, what are you going to do for me now? Right. <laughs> you know, that we put That's you in a narrative, right. to, to run things. And is it reasonable to expect or to perceive Obama as the president of black America as opposed to the president of the entire United States? There is some merit. It, obviously, if you've actually worked hard to get somebody into right. office, it's the American way. People say, well, okay, tip for tat. I've helped you out. Now, what are you going to do for me? It remains to be seen what's going to happen during the second term, whether there will be a more overt courting yeah. of the black electorate, which put Obama into office. But yeah. at the same time, it's a big country. And you still got to deal with the other side. And hopefully it's, it's not anything symbolic. You know, I think about the last two or three years of the Clinton administration. And he has this huge conversation on race, right? And he gets John Hope Franklin involved in the conversation. You know, there, there was no end game, right? It really was a symbolic effort to get us to talk about race. Uh, my sense is that that's not the president's style, right? But, you know, are we going to see anything beyond, you know, really something that's symbolic? What's going to be the signature legislation? Because you still have to deal with the House and the Senate to right. get things done. I mean, there is no king in America. Yeah. He can't just declare, well, I want to have this done. I don't care what you guys think. Right. Despite what the right says. You right. still have to have right. some support. You still have to work out something to get things passed in Congress. So it should be a fascinating four years. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been surprised by the secession conversation? No, I mean, what's surprising about it, if you've read Jonathan Haidt's book on, on righteous, the righteous mind, and he's got these kind of concepts of sort of what conservative uh, moral grounding is, and one of them is loyalty and obedience to authority. Yeah. And so we say, well, do you buy that? Mm -hmm. Then this is disobedience, and we've never seen this kind of outpouring before. Right. This has never seen this kind of reaction. Certainly, there was no love for Bill Clinton, and nobody talked about secession. Yeah, right. So then you have to look at one more element if you're taking hate's template seriously, and that is the kind of the purity contamination part of it. And that's where the, this makes sense all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. If what you're saying is my America cannot be run by a black man because my identity is white and, and American ness is white ness, yeah. then it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. we, we, there's no other protest except separation right. from this thing. And so, so that all of a sudden, it, you know, hate's model you know, remains intact. And uh, sadly, it makes perfect sense. And then when you ask some of these folks who are interested in secession, well, is it really racially motivated? You know, some will deny it. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not the kind of thing that people will say openly or in mixed company, yet if you look at some of the message boards, some of the things that are on Facebook yeah. where people are anonymous, they come with it there. Right. You know, they're straight up there. But I'm not sure if you're going to be able to get people to come into a room with people who are not necessarily on the same side yeah. of the opinion right. and say, well, yeah, that's right. That, that is exactly what I think. I think that it's racially motivated. If you are the person who is being accused yeah. of using race as a reason for whatever you're doing. We've been joined this afternoon by Frank Stacio, longtime host of the State of Things here in WNC in the Triangle. Anthony Wilson, weekend anchor and reporter for the local ABC television affiliate. Thanks for joining us this afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.
Back to Left of Black, I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We have a special treat this afternoon as we are joined by the legendary jazz vocalist, Nina Freelon, and next to her bassist, John Brown, director of the jazz program here at Duke University, a bassist extraordinaire in his own right. And they are here talking about their new CD, Nina Freelon and the John Brown Big Band, simply called Christmas. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And so I, I've been fans of, of both of you for a long time, uh, Nina for a long time, so we're so happy to have you on the show. Uh, John teaches in the class right before me. Right, that's right. <laughs> um, so as we're listening to jazz, and, and then the class segues into Michael Jackson and a few students in both classes. Um, so again, it's a treat to have both of you here. But you've worked together before, uh, yes. so this is not the first time. Oh, why a Christmas album? Well, um, you know, I think every artist longs to do a holiday um, album. I, I can't think of a single person that hasn't been in the business for a while that mm -hmm. has not done a holiday album. But for me, um, it really was sentimental. I lost my mom and my dad um, fairly recently. And, mm -hmm. they, and for me, fa Christmas meant family. Yeah. And so this is a tribute to them. It's my gift also to myself because it's a way for me to still celebrate what Christmas has meant to me growing up and having children of my own and now grandchildren, ah, loving that. <laughs> and to work with my good friend John uh, in a big band setting yeah. is just delicious. It's, it's really a wonderful opportunity. It's like riding in a Cadillac <laughs> or uh, some other big utility big vehicle. <laughs> What's it like? Because, you know, you two rep Dorm in, in a really <laughs> significant kind of way. And, and you know, Dorm's going through this interesting transformation. You know, it's, you know, I almost want to call it hipster Dorm these yeah. days, you know, because you get that dynamic. <laughs> right, right. They have all these wonderful new restaurants and cupcake shops yes. and all those kinds of things. Uh, but one of the things that's been a constant about Dorm is that there has been a very vital art scene. Yes. For a long time. And now there are venues like Deepak and other places, um, Carolina Theater, where the two of you will be performing on the 21st of December. Um, what's it like now to be in Durham with this, you know, with this really kind of expansive art scene? I've been really pleased with uh, how the city has embraced this progressive movement, uh, just uh, over all areas first, but really when it comes to the arts, there are, are, as you say, new venues and new opportunities for people to be social, and I, I'm really encouraged by what's on the horizon for I, I believe to be a very healthy and vibrant art scene that's going to rival those uh, nationally. Totally. And food has always fed the arts in this town. Yeah. I don't know if that's true in other places. But early in my career, I don't know about you, John, I cut my teeth, so to speak, uh, singing in restaurants yeah. because there were no clubs. Right. And so you found yourself at another time or you found yourself at Pie Wacket singing mm -hmm. inside of a restaurant or singing inside of the lobby of a hotel. So the food, um, the, 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 the food culture mm -hmm. has always fed the music and the art scene here in, in Durham. And, and I think they're tied together. When I see a new restaurant open up, it, it, it could be another venue for presenting music. And I think, I think that has to be kind of looked at. Maybe that's what makes Durham a little bit more special than places that don't have laws that keep you from having a club. You did a show recently at the BU Cafe, uh, which is owned by Dorian uh, Bolden, yes. uh, Duke grad. Um, and it's a really sm intimate space. I mean, what's it like, you know, because it, I think young folks now, because their idea of music is either mediated through watching music video mm -hmm. or listening in their iPods or something like that, or going to these huge concert stages. Um, what's it like to, to actually be able to go back to these very intimate venues, you know, where you're literally sitting on top of folks, <laughs> <laughs> right? You, you know, you can smell them, you can see the beads of sweat. Um, in, in some ways, very traditional for yeah. jazz clubs, right? But yeah, I, I think it's it's. Well, the way that music is meant to be experienced. Uh, you don't just hear music, you don't just see people perform, but you experience what the music has to offer you in the moment. And, and for many people who are actually in the audience when people are performing, it's, it's a, a journey towards self-discovery. Okay. And I really believe that that's 
the purest way to experience what artists have to share with you. And, and it's true, I mean, you know, places like the Blue Note, I remember distinctly the first time I went to the Blue Note in New York, uh, I heard Tony Williams. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a place that, uh, interestingly, we played, uh, you're right, the great drummer Tony Williams. That's right. And, uh, and then I had the opportunity to play with Nina at that same place. And, uh, you know, that, that was an emotional experience for me because I, you know, when I was 19, I guess, when I heard Tony Williams there. And then to get to play there with somebody like Nina Freelon, and the I remember having to walk through the audience with the tables, you know, right <laughs> here. Right, right. Open, open your butt down excuse me, excuse right. Me. Right. Excuse yeah. me. And I remember distinctly having to carry, we, we did a double bill, I think, with um, uh, James Carter. Is oh, right? yes, yes. And we had to come off stage, so I had to hold my bass up in the air yeah, and right, walk, to walk through the out. tables right. to get back and forth. And, and you're right, just to be that close in a place like you know, the BU creates that, that similar atmosphere is my point. But the, to be in that kind of space really allows people to experience what artists have to offer and vice versa. We, we are certainly fed by the energy we get from audiences. Oh, totally. And to have people that close is, I, I like having people I that close. I love it. I mean, but you know, some people don't really like people. Okay? <laughs> That's true. There are some really shy musicians. Why they would choose to put themselves in the lion's mouth every night, I don't know. <laughs> right. yeah. But there are some shy human beings for whom that kind of setting yeah, is really sense. upsetting. Yeah. Um, I really feel like there's a digital divide that's different from the way we usually define that. Mm -hmm. In the ability to access music, to consume music at a distance from the performer. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I cared about Stevie Wonder's new record. Yeah. I was waiting, I was waiting in line, <laughs> you know, for the record to come out so I could get it in my hot hands. In my little town in, in Cambridge, Boston area, yeah. as far from Stevie as I could possibly yeah. be. <laughs> but I was waiting on that record and I cared about him as a human being. I remember when he was in that horrible car accident, we were yeah. all, you know, I, I, hope, he's, I hope he's okay, right. my, my goodness, you know. And I see a distance now being created by the digitalization of this music, where we can consume a portion of something and not care or not care to know who created it, yeah. uh, where it was sampled from. And, and I think the intimate setting takes us back mm -hmm. to why we love music in the first place. Mm -hmm. You could hear somebody make a mistake. People love that. Oh, they love to see you mess up. Um, people could hear a story that they wouldn't hear on a on recording. The they can ask you, because people ask us questions yeah. at the BU. Uh, how did you come up with this idea? Or what made you think of so-and-so? And in that way, you build a relationship with human beings heart to heart. Yeah. And you will always have those people as your fans if you can you know, if you can make that bridge. You're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony. We're here at the John Hope Franklin Center, joined by special guests today, vocalist Nina Freelon and bassist extraordinaire John Brown, talking about their new recording, Nina Freelon and the John Brown Big Band, simply titled Christmas. Uh, talk a little bit about, you know, some of the kind of music industry politics. Uh, this is a, a, a recording that was done on an independent label. Uh, I know your last report recording was something that you did, you know, kind of going the indie route. Um, Nina, you know, you spent a good portion of your career with, you know, one, a huge label label, yes. and then a huge jazz label. Yes. Um, what are the differences, you know, uh, at this moment where you can really have much more control over your music. You know, obviously you're not going to sell as many CDs and there's not going to be a full page ad we in might. Billboard. We <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there there is a lot to be said for having a label that's willing to spend money, but I'm finding increasingly they don't know where to spend it. Uh, We're talking micro yeah. markets here. Yeah. We're talking mama and them yeah. and all their friends can make you uh, quite a sensation when you are controlling the product. Yeah. Uh, when you're not having to split royalties between, mm -hmm. you know, the one dollar that you're supposed to get and the 95 cents that they take because they say you don't deserve. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the independent um, route is the new new yeah. as, as far as, as I see. We've sold um, 
probably about 1,500 mm -hmm. units right now. It's only been out a month. Which is actually great numbers. Those for, are be for better jazz numbers. Right, for better jazz numbers than, yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. And so Brown Boulevard is John's label. And he uh, graciously, because I'm not interested in being a record company executive, <laughs> I have too many hats on as it is. Yeah. Um, and so we are collaborating to make sure that it gets, and we're having to do some unusual marketing things. We went store to store, non-traditional places to find this record. So you could find it at BU. Park and Otis, that's, that's why I started. Park you can and find Otis, it at Park yeah. and Otis. You can find it at my favorite um, uh, restaurants, Loaf. You can find it there. Yeah. Um, you walk in, because it's a Christmas product, yeah. you can um, justify a point of purchase sale by just having it on the yeah. so we've we've gone around and we've actually sold about six hundred and fifty at non traditional yeah. places. These this is too small of a market for universal distributing to be interested in. Yeah. But it's enough to make sure that we don't have nine hundred and ninety nine CDs on December right. twenty sixth that we have to stare at until this time next year. So there's almost kind of a, a gorilla a gorilla marketing aspect to totally. it. Totally. Right. Totally. Do you think there are a lot of artists, particularly more established artists, that are a little turned off when their career has to take that turn? Because you know, I think about the work that your son Pierce does with the Beast, right? And so they it, they're almost naturally created for this kind of guerrilla marketing, right? But for older established artists, you know, do you feel that they feel a little put upon, you know, having to go this non-traditional route to kind of get their music out there? I don't know. I mean, most people. Uh, and who, who came up in a large label situation uh, that I know have had to do the work anyway. Yeah, that's and so they kind of, you know, moan about how the record company <laughs> not doing A, B, C, and D. Um, so they either go without or they um, jump in and do what is ever is, is necessary to, to win the day. And I think the creativity that you put into your music, you know, I always say you have to be as improvisational on the bandstand as off the bandstand. You, ha you deserve to make a living and a good living doing what you love. And you just have to figure it out. We're problem solvers. That's what we do. We do it inside music. And we do it inside of our lives. So they, they kind of feed each other. Would you agree, John? I, I do. I do. I, I, one point I want to address is that I really do believe firmly in preserving the vision that an artist brings to a project. And uh, that's why I decided to go the independent route. I was actually talking with the record company before I released my first CD, just in planning. And, uh, you know, they had, you know, there was a nice check sitting on the table, and, you know, here's what's going to get you started. Now, uh, for this third song, we, we want you to do this. <laughs> right, right. And right. I said, well, no, I've, I've kind of thought this through, and right. I've, I've already right. got right. what right. I want to do, I the plan. arrangement, right? I got a plan. And they said, yeah, no, again, so for this third song, we're going to need you to do this. And I just kind of said, well, um, you know, I, I want to do it this way, and it just uh, in my mind, I, I left them, you know, it was all cordial. Let me just think about it. Uh, I'm still thinking about it with them Walk as away. I release five or six yeah. different yeah. things on my own. <laughs> um, and, and it's true, when it comes to the, the guerrilla marketing and, and really reaching your audience, I think that's empowering mm -hmm. artists to really reach people who care about who their care work. About the music. Right. There are record companies, uh, and, you know, many of them are known for having a distance to just to find out how they can collect money off of your back. And wherever that is, fine. And, and if it reaches people who really care about the music, that's a, an ancillary benefit to them. They're first concerned about the money. But when was the last time you bought a record in a record store? It, exactly. Exactly. This is this is the this is the this is a changing industry. Absolutely. We're looking at dinosaurs, yeah. and they're way slow <laughs> to get with the program. Yeah. So non-traditional outlets, um, combining food and music. As Starbucks, creating an experience, has done. Creating, creating an experience, an experience right. making sure that the music is where the people are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Big, bulky organizations are slow like sloths, <laughs> and they just can't. You know, I may find I found myself in Austria. Was my record there? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe. But I couldn't be sure that it would be there. I knew I was going to be there, but yeah. I didn't know that my record would be there. Yeah. So. This is the kind of thing, and you know, guerrilla marketing, whatever you want to call it, we all started with the people who love us the best. Yeah. That's yeah. people who know you, yeah. your relatives, 
you know, your friends, mm -hmm. they will support you. And then the ring goes out, you know, further and further from there. And I found that that always, went, that always kind of works. You're watching Left of Black. We're here with John Brown, associate professor of the practice of music and director of the jazz program here at Duke University. Nina Freilon, longtime jazz vocalist. Uh, I want to ask you, John, because uh, you're in a unique position because uh, you're in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in some ways you almost have this added responsibility that you're not just teaching jazz classes, but in some ways you're really introducing the vitality of the form to young folks who've never been asked to really think about it, who think about it as their parents' music, or even worse, their grandparents' <laughs> right. music. Um, what's that like in the classroom trying to introduce jazz? You know, to kids who've been raised on bad pop music and some hip hop and some other stuff. I remember sitting outside the class one day and, and you were teaching them about the groove mm. and you were playing Barry White. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and I imagine that's kind of a strategy that you have to use, right, in order to get them to connect to what you're talking about sonically. Certainly, yeah. certainly. But you know, it, it's a challenge that I, I actually enjoy because there are so many students. You know, the, the student who I like the most is the one who sits in my class on the first day like this. You ain't going movie. Right. <laughs> That's right. Because, I mean, just this semester there was a, a gentleman who, who was, I mean, he didn't actually do it, but in everything <laughs> that he wrote and in all of our conversations that he was just in a place where he was not going to be moved. I mean, so much so that I said, why did you take my class again? If you knew that you were going to come with this resistance, why are you here? Uh, and in fact, on the last day of class, near the last day of class, um, I, I was kind of, you know, preparing for what we know is oh, it's a bittersweet, bittersweet time. We're at the end of class, and we've only got two or three classes left. And let's start having these kind of wrap-up conversations. Yeah. So I leave you with everything, you know, filling in any gaps that you have, so we have appropriate time to deal with it. And this is what this this gentleman just said: I like jazz now. Wow. <laughs> and for me, I just you know, that makes it worth. Not that I'm discounting the rest of the class, but. Right. I got him, it it worth it. and that does make it worth it. So it, it, it's a challenge that I accept and we're going to cultivate because if we move people anywhere closer to loving and embracing the music, we have, we've done something. You're doing a show on December the 21st at the Carolina Theater. Mm -hmm. um, talk about you know, pulling that together, the kind of excitement to, to allow Dorm to come in and, and kind of share in this celebration of, of of the holidays, but also a celebration of, of, of good collaborative music. Well, this uh, is our Christmas present yeah, to, nice. to, to the area. I, I don't perform locally that often. I, I um, purposely mm -hmm. do not play locally very much. And that's so that when we do a big concert like this, Carolina Theater is 1,200 seats. If you're playing everywhere around town, it's kind of hard to fill right. a concert hall like right. that. So I like to make it a special event yeah. by, as a headliner, only being in place uh, on a select yeah. uh, number of days. So this is it. This is the answer to the question when I run into somebody in Harris Tita, <laughs> girl, where you going to play around here? <laughs> this is the answer, December 21st. Um, and we really wanted, we thought about doing a smaller group we were like, you know, we big brain, big, big band. band. This is what we, we need band. to really yeah. go hard, and so we are just thrilled to be able to give this Christmas gift. It's very close to Christmas, December twenty first. You finish your shopping, right. your turkeys in the oven. <laughs> right. You have no excuse. You don't already have a record. The record just came out, so uh, it's it's an opportunity to exhale and to really enjoy the fruits of the season. And the people who come to hear us know us. Yeah. This is special. Yeah. It's not like we're playing in Chicago. I know some people in Chicago, and some of them will come and some of them won't. But friends, people who knew you before you were famous, yeah. people who taught your children in school, this is some love. So we're just, we're just totally thrilled to be playing at home, to be home for the holidays. You're home for the holidays, but so are we. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I could be anywhere. Yeah. And so that really makes it warm and wonderful. Yeah, and I, I get agree. to play with my friend, and he's going to sing. Oh, you're going to sing? Oh, I'm going to sing. <laughs> what are your self favorite, some of your favorite songs on the CD? Because, yeah, you know, everybody has a favorite Christmas song, right? What, what leaps to mind uh, is, is a, a tune that it has a couple of different points of interest. Uh, Swingle Jingle Bells was uh, given to us by Frank Foster, who was the legendary yeah. 
yeah. saxophonist, composer, arranger, yeah. and all around great human being. Yeah. And uh, it, this is a way for us to honor him. And in fact, we, we're proud at Duke to have his materials in our jazz archive. Yeah. He wanted things to be here. And, and I actually kind of view that as a responsibility. He told, uh, told Mrs., Mrs. Foster that I was the person that he wanted to appoint to make sure his music was heard. And I consider that to be a huge responsibility. So anytime I have a chance to share his music with the world, yeah, I take it. Wonderful. So that that one for me, and, and, and by the way, that Swingle Jingle Bells, that piece was written just for Nina. So this record presented us with yet, yet another opportunity to connect that piece uh, with him being such a, a good friend to both of us mm -hmm. and uh, get that out to the world as soon as we had an opportunity. Yeah. I want to ask you kind of a related question, Nina, and we've talked about this before in different contexts. Um, both of you have mentioned the importance of kind of family and community and all those kinds of things. Uh, one of my favorite tracks that you've done uh, is uh, Heritage. Oh, uh, you know, Duke Ellington's recording. And so talk a little bit about that song and your recording of the song. Uh, there's a great Joe Williams version oh, of it. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, your, your parents set you on a kind of trajectory for your life. And you don't even realize how much they set you on a path. And my parents planted the love of jazz music and good music in general so, so deeply that I thought it was my idea. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so singing um, that tune, Heritage, sing, singing, my mother, the greatest and the prettiest. I could sing it from a position of really believing that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we have another Ellington composition on this record mm -hmm. that's not a traditional Christmas song. Yeah. It's from the Far East Suite. Okay. And it's called... Um, I Like the Sunrise. I Like the Sunrise. sunrise. And just as jazz artists do, we make anything be what we want it to be. That's right. So it's, for me, it's about, you know, how many times do your kids ask you, is it Christmas yet? We got an advent calendar. We've yeah. counted down the right, days. Right, is it today? Right. Is it today? <laughs> so this tune, I Like the Sunrise, is about that anticipation. And I wonder about pe people, if you, if you look at the old story, the Christmas story of people walking in the dark through the desert, looking at a light in the sky, anticipating this grand birth, and then finding their way to a lowly stable. That's a, that's, that's a wonderful metaphor, even for this music. You go through all this stuff to get to something, and you find something supposedly so simple, yet divine. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just really hopeful that this will find their way and this record will find their way into people's collection. You know, I've got the Mahalia Jackson Christmas. <laughs> I've got Ella swinging Christmas. Nat King I've Cole. got Nat King yeah. Cole. <laughs> you know, I have my little Christmas favorites, but this record really truly from our hearts is a, is a gift to to this community in particular but the whole world. The CD is simply titled Christmas. Nina Freelon and the John Brown Big Band. We've been joined by Nina Freelon, a longtime vocalist, one of my favorites. John Brown, bassist extraordinaire, uh, associate professor of the practice of music here at Duke University, also the director of the jazz program. They will be performing on December the 21st at the Carolina Theater. Make sure to come out and support. Thank you both for joining us Thank this you. afternoon. It's a real pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you for so having us. Yeah. Eric, you're a real life Eric. G for this one. <laughs> yeah. All black everything. All black, you know. All black in the name of all my black heroes. All black everything. All black polos. All black medallions, yeah. All black, you know, say. All black everything. All black, you know. All black in the name of all my black heroes.